The Lord be with you. Welcome to those of you who are gathered here in our sanctuary and to those of you who are worshiping with us online. If you are watching from home, I encourage you to download the bulletin from the homepage of the website so that you might participate fully in the service. The flowers on the chancel this morning are given to the glory of God and in loving, loving memory of the Fry and Herlock families by Susie Fry Herlock. Today we welcome Tony's husband, Ted Barr, back to the piano. We also welcome John David Smith, who is a professor of music at the University of Delaware and principal horn of Opera Philadelphia, the Chamber Orchestra of Philadelphia, and the Philly Pops. We are thrilled that both of you will be offering your gifts to the glory of God. Today we extend our sympathy to Dan Weber upon the death of his sister, Caroline. I encourage you to hold Dan and the rest of his family in your prayers in the coming days. The Afghan refugee family we are helping to sponsor arrived safely on Friday. The family consists of a mom and her five and seven year old sons. We are hoping the dad will be able to join them in the next month. We thank a large group of volunteers from Westminster, from Congregation Beth Shalom, and from the Muslim community for their efforts to settle this family and help them integrate into the wider community. I draw your attention to page seven of your bulletin where you will find information on our various educational offerings for children, youth, and adults. A couple of things of note. Today is the last day we will have copies of The Sum of Us available for purchase. You can pick one up for $15 after worship, start reading, and then watch the Weekly Word for information on our One Book, One Church discussion groups. This Thursday, the Peace and Justice Work Group will welcome Jeffrey Richardson of the University of Delaware, who will focus on environmental justice, race, and the future of America. After worship next Sunday, we will hear from guest speaker Nathan Stuckey, who is the director of the Farminary Project at Princeton Seminary. Dr. Stuckey will speak to us about faith in an exhausted world. Friends, today is not only Halloween, it is also the anniversary of Martin Luther nailing his 95 theses to a church door in Wittenberg, Germany, an act that ignited the Protestant Reformation. For this reason, the last Sunday of October is always Reformation Sunday, the day when Presbyterians and other Reformed Christians celebrate the tradition that grounds our faith. With gratitude for our heritage, let us worship God.
God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Though the earth should change or the mountains shake, we will not fear. Our God is exalted among the nations. Our God is exalted throughout the earth. Friends, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But when we confess our sin, God, who is faithful, forgives us and transforms our hearts. Trusting that God receives us with grace, let us confess our sin and the sin of this world. Praying together, holy and gracious God, we confess today to the same sins that have always plagued your church. We are too stuck in our ways, too resistant to your spirit, too attracted to power and privilege, too quick to build walls, too slow to build bridges. By your spirit, form and reform us that we might be faithful witnesses to your glory and grace. Amen. Siblings in Christ, hear the good news. Even when we are not faithful, God is faithful. For the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. And let all God's people say, Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, by your spirit, open our minds that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may be led into your truth and taught your will. Amen. A reading from Deuteronomy. Now this is the commandment, the statues and the ordinances, that the Lord your God charged me to teach you to observe in the land that you are about to cross into and occupy, so that you and your children and your children's children may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life, 
and keep all his decrees and his commandments that I am commanding you, so that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe them diligently, so that it may go well with you, and so you may multiply greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorsteps of your house and on your gates. This is the word of the Lord. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. At a conference a few years ago, a colleague named Kim told a story about the power of words imprinted upon the heart. Like many of us, Kim had grown up in the church. She spent every Sunday morning of her childhood on a pew in the balcony, worshiping with her mother and brother and then running off to Sunday school. When she was in eighth grade, she entered the catechism class where she learned the doctrines and creeds of the church before confirmation. Yes, Kim's home congregation took seriously the charge to nurture and support baptized children in the faith. Many years after she was confirmed when Kim was a grown woman with children of her own, her mother was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. The prognosis was bleak. During a seven-hour surgery, the doctor discovered that the cancer had spread There was little to be done. After the operation, as Kim was curled up beside her mom on the hospital bed, there was a knock on the door. A familiar face appeared around the curtain, and immediately two sentences popped into Kim's head. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death, to my faithful savior, Jesus Christ. These are the opening lines of the Heidelberg Catechism, one of the reformed confessions that Kim learned in eighth grade. Though she hadn't realized it until that moment, she had carried these words in her heart for years. They'd been etched there ever since Kim first learned them from the woman now standing before her in that hospital room. 
With the unexpected visit of her eighth grade catechism teacher, they rose to the forefront of her mind. I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful savior, Jesus Christ. The words of faith have a way of burrowing deep within us, taking up residence in our hearts, building a home in our souls. Some of us have the language of scripture inscribed there. Others carry the lyrics of beloved hymns or the refrains of oft recited prayers. We have learned these words at the knees of parents and grandparents, heard them repeated by Sunday school teachers and mentors, and echoed by saints within the congregation. We've recited these words in worship, in study, in daily devotion. We've sung them around the piano and practiced them in prayer circles. They shape our faith. And then throughout life, they return to us, particularly in moments of confusion or crisis. As Kim discovered, they offer a lifeline in the midst of a stormy sea, an anchor for our restless or breaking hearts in the bedrock of the gospel promise. Whether from scripture or song, creed or prayer, these words of faith ground our lives. But more than that, they shape who we are as people of faith, not only in anxious moments when we cling to the assurance of God's grace, but in the ordinary rhythms of life when it could be easy to go about daily routines without considering God's claim on us. This was Moses' intention when he instructed the people to keep the great commandment in their hearts, that these words would shape the ethos and witness of the covenant community. As you heard in the beginning of today's reading, Moses is instructing the people Israel in the law of the Lord so that they may prosper in the promised land. At this point in the narrative, the Hebrew people whom Moses led out of slavery and guided through the wilderness now stand on a precipice. They are about to cross over into the promised land. So Moses is preparing them for this new chapter in their shared story. The book of Deuteronomy is a collection of commandments that govern right living. Together, these statutes make it clear that any prosperity the people enjoy in the promised land is not a reward for faithfulness, but the result of faithfulness. That when they live according to the law of God, the whole community will flourish. Every law contained within the pages of Deuteronomy flows from the first and greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. In other words, the covenant community is to love God fully with every fiber of their collective being. As one scholar so beautifully summarized it, Israel's response to God is an extravagant love that involves conscience or heart, essence or soul, and vitality or might. What Moses says next underscores the importance of this statute. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem upon your forehead, and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. It is not enough simply to hear these words proclaimed when the community gathers. It is not enough simply to post them on their doors. No, the people are to commit this commandment to memory. They are to imprint it upon their hearts. Love the Lord your God should be the first words that spring to mind in the morning. With all your heart, your soul, your might should be the quiet refrain that lulls the faithful to sleep each night. 
Recite these words to your children, Moses urges. Talk about them around the dinner table and when you're cleaning your child's scraped knee, when you collect clothing for the needy or set a feast for a stranger, talk about these words so that they inform every single decision, every single conversation, every single action. If the people do this, if they recite these words to their children and fix them on their foreheads and write them on their doors, then this commandment will shape their faith. But more than that, it will shape who they are as people of faith. For in loving God with heart, soul, and might, they will become a community bound together by an ethic of love. They will become a nation defined by compassion and care. After all, if this first commandment is sealed upon the heart, if it truly orients one's entire being toward God, then there is no option but to treat the widow and the orphan and the immigrant with the same extravagant love. That is precisely why in the passage that Greg preached on two weeks ago, Jesus weds this commandment to another like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart, recite them to your children, bind them as a sign on your hand, write them on the doorposts of your house. As it happens, the witness of scripture and the annals of the church are testaments to the forgetfulness of God's people. Rather than following Moses' instruction upon entering the promised land, the covenant community worshipped other gods, neglected the needs of the poor, and failed to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with their God. That's why God anointed kings and raised up prophets and finally sent the long-awaited Messiah to reorient wandering hearts. Throughout time, the church of Jesus Christ has also forgotten the greatest commandment. This is part of our history. 500 years ago, the Western church was effectively exploiting the masses by promising forgiveness in exchange for a financial contribution. In response, reformers like Martin Luther and John Calvin and others you see in that arc across the top of our sanctuary window, the reformers tried to call the church back to faith and faithfulness. One of the ways they did so was by reclaiming Old Testament texts the church had practically forgotten, reclaiming and recentering the commandments in worship, reminding the church what it means to live in covenant relationship with God. Alas, the Reformation did not completely reform the church. 500 years later, we are still confessing the ways that we too have failed to love God with heart, soul, and might, the ways we have failed to love our neighbors as ourselves. Though we are generations removed from those who first heard Moses' words, his charge to us is the same. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children, bind them as a sign on your hand, write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The charge stands because the work is the same. In every age, the covenant community must return to the words that shape our faith and that shape who we are as people of faith. Whether the commandments of scripture or the lyrics of beloved hymns, the confessions of the church, or simple reminders of God's claim on our lives, we carry these words in our hearts. We recite them to our children. We hold them close within our communal conscience. And by God's grace, the Spirit seals these words upon our hearts and our minds so that they inform every decision, every conversation, every action, and we remember who we are. A few weeks before I left for my freshman year of college, while I was packing up my childhood bedroom and trying to con convince myself that I was ready to leave home, 
my mom gave me a gift. It was a bracelet with a single charm, a shell, the symbol of baptism. And as I fastened the bracelet on my wrist as though binding a reminder of God's claim on my life as a sign upon my hand, my mom offered a simple charge. Remember who you are and whose you are. Remember who you are and whose you are. It is the same phrase that a colleague of mine recites every morning as she drops her children off at school. They are the last words she speaks after she's checked that they've grabbed their lunch boxes, after she's ensured that the homework made its way into the bag, she gives her children hugs and says to them, remember who you are and whose you are. My colleague recites this phrase every morning because she wants her children to carry these words in their hearts. Whether they are learning their multiplication tables or eating their lunch or playing double dutch on the blacktop, she wants them to remember that they belong to God. So that when they see a little girl sitting alone in the cafeteria, they might invite her to join them at their table. Or when they encounter a bully on the playground, they might stand up for the child being picked on. My colleague recites these words to her children so that one day they might grow into adults who feed the hungry and clothe the naked and welcome the stranger. She recites these words so that her children always remember that they are heirs of the covenant set apart to love God with the whole of who they are and to love their neighbors as themselves. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. People of the covenant, remember who you are and whose you are. Carry the words of faith in your heart so that in all things your response to God and neighbor might be one of extravagant love.
Siblings in Christ, as we prepare to celebrate the sacrament of baptism, let us join together in our opening words. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. In baptism, God claims us and seals us to show that we belong to God. God frees us from sin and death, uniting us with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, the body of Christ, and joined to Christ's ministry of love, justice, and peace. Let us remember with joy our own baptism as we celebrate this sacrament. On behalf of the session of Westminster Presbyterian Church, I present Je Jeffrey Anthony Keller, son of Brittany and David Keller, to receive the sacrament of baptism. Brittany and David, since it is your desire to have Jeffrey baptized, please declare your intention by responding to the following questions. Do you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I do. Relying on God's grace, do you promise to live the Christian faith and to teach that faith to your child? Will we, the people of the church, nurture and support Jeffrey, and will we encourage him to become a faithful Christian? We will. Normally, the children of our congregation would join us on the chancel steps for a baptism. Unfortunately, we are not yet back to normal, but I do see a few gathered here in the sanctuary, and I have a question for you. And whether you are here in the sanctuary or watching from home or the playground, I hope you will respond boldly. So children, do you promise to help Jeffrey be a part of our church family by being a friend to him? If so, please say yes. I, I think you can do it louder. Please say yes. yes. That's better. Amen. <laughs> Through the sacrament of baptism, we become members of Christ's body. As the Church of Jesus Christ, let us stand and say what we believe. Church, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. Faithful God, in countless ways you have revealed yourself in ages past and have blessed us with signs of your grace. We rejoice that you liberated your people from bondage through the waters of the sea. We rejoice that you sent your son who was baptized in Jordan's waters and anointed with your spirit. We rejoice that you claim us in the waters of baptism and deliver us from death to life. As we gather around this font, send your spirit to move over this water that it may be a fountain of deliverance and rebirth. May those who pass through its waters be raised to new and abundant life and united with Christ and his church. Pour out your spirit upon Jeffrey, that he may live the faith of his baptism, 
and participate in Christ's ministry of love, justice, and peace. In your holy name we pray, amen. Okay, Jeff, are you ready? Can you come here? Hey, bud, I like that you brought your balls along. That was a great idea. Ugh. Oh, I know, I know. This is a little bit overwhelming. Jeffrey Anthony, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son, I know, and of the Holy Spirit. Child of God, child of the covenant, you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. Well done. You managed. I know. I just poured water on your head. You're thinking, what is this lady doing? But you're a little bit squirmy, so I'm going to hand you back. It's okay. You, are, you did a great job. So, Jeffrey, your dad's best friend wrote a song about baptism. And in that song, he says, Perhaps you are too young, my child, to fully realize that so many in this church today will touch you with their lives. And I want to introduce you to some of the people who are going to touch you with their lives. Look around, bud. Every person in this sanctuary and every person watching from home has made a promise to you today. They have promised, I know, they have promised to raise you in the faith. And they will do that by being your friends in Sunday school and by being your teachers at Vacation Bible School. They will do that by being your mentors at confirmation and by serving alongside you on mission trips. They will do that by being conversation partners and models of what it looks like to love God with heart and soul and might. They will do that by being companions on the journey. And that is true for you, David and Brittany, as well. They will be your companions as you seek to raise Jeffrey in the faith. Let us pray. Gracious God, giver of life, you have called each of us by name and promised to love us faithfully. We ask your blessing upon Jeffrey Anthony, your beloved child whom you have claimed and called. May your spirit rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Empower him, we pray, that he may grow in faith, in hope, and in love, and empower all of us to keep the promises we have made this day. Fashion us into a faithful people that we might follow Christ and bear witness to your grace in word and in deed. This we pray in the name of your Son, our Lord, who gave us words to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
people of the covenant, remember who and whose you are so that in all things your response to God and neighbor might be one of extravagant love. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Alleluia. Amen. Thank you.